Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rafal Gingales. I'm the Senior Director of Field Application Science here at Unchained Labs, covering the analytical portfolio of some more products. So I'm really excited today to be your moderator, uh, and I want to welcome you and thank you again for joining us today. And so let's just get some of the admi administrative tasks out of the way. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And so we invite you to participate in the Q&A by clicking on the icon at the top or bottom of your Zoom navigation um, screen. Uh, and simply type in your question. And so sometimes we don't have enough time to go through all of the questions, so we encourage you not to click anonymous. This will allow us to follow up with you in case we cannot fill your questions during the live Q&A session. Okay, so I'd like to introduce you to Kevin Lenz. He's our marketing manager for the analytical portfolio. Uh, and so today I'm really excited about the topic. Kevin is going to walk us through how the uncle can give you capsid stability insight as well as aggregation info using only nine microliter of sample, right? And um, using, of course, the uncle platform in a very efficient manner. So Kevin, the show is yours. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Rafar. I'll see you at the other side. Sounds good. Okay, so. Like Rafar said, today I'll be talking about uh, seeing when AAV hits the eject button, a button with Uncle. Uh, I'll be focusing on looking at AAV and its two different types of caps of stability uh, and a lot of different buffers, you know, and different pHs as well. So first, let me introduce you to uh, Unchained Labs Gene Therapy Squad. So we've been using our squad for all kinds of problems and all kinds of gene therapy tech and vectors. Um, and so we've been honing our tools to deliver answers and save boatloads of time for AAV and other viruses. Uh, so today I'll be focusing on the work that Uncle can do for capsid stability, genome ejection and aggregation for AAV, along with an assist from Big Tuna as well. Now, AAV is a truly complex biologic. Uh, it has uh, a complex protein capsid. It is a larger size than most biologics and it contains a DNA payload as well. So one helpful way for me to think about this is of course, like the pinata, uh, where the DNA is the candy inside and the capsid is the cardboard and colored paper. And if we have this helpful pinata AAV model in our heads, then I can quickly explain what Uncle does to AAV, uh, which is this. So Uncle is going to use a thermal ramp to stretch out, chop apart, break up AAV. Uh, so that makes Uncle the broadsword wielding uh, Viking here, who's chopping up those AAV capsids. And that means that you know, the French scientists uh, in the background are they're excited to cheer on this process and see the results. Now, a little bit about Uncle's background. So our Uncle is a combination of three different uh, technologies uh, combined. So they read all of these different uh, data points on one sample with the ability to control temperature. So full spectrum fluorescence uh, gives you the ability to look at both protein intrinsic fluorescence or dye uh, fluorescence, which is something we'll make use of here as we'll look at both the intrinsic fluorescence of capsid proteins unfolding and the dye-based fluorescence as DNA is leaving capsids. Uh, static light scattering, or SLS, helps you see when aggregates form in the same time as fluorescence data. And that's a lot like you know, shining a laser pointer on a foggy day. Uh, when particles start to form, you get more scattering and more SLS signal. And gathering both that fluorescence and SLS signal at the same time is very helpful since you see when unfolding and aggregation occur simultaneously. And lastly, dynamic light scattering, or DLS, uh, gets a really uh, uh, excellent picture on size and size distribution on your sample, helping you understand if you're starting with a nice monodisperse AAV capsids or if your sample has already undergone some uh, aggregation. And the temperature control that I mentioned allows you to do these experiments uh, at room temperature, elevated isothermal temperatures, across uh, heat ramps, which is the most common, or any of a variety of different thermal profiles. So first, let me introduce you to one of the unique features of our system, which is the uni. The uni is a, an array of 16 uh, quartz cuvettes in an aluminum frame uh, that enables you to gather all of this fluorescence and light scattering data on only nine microliters of sample. All you have to do is simply pipette in that nine microliters into each cuvette, uh, close it shut with the blue frame, and silicone seals that protect your sample from evaporation. So because the uni is so truly unique and well-engineered, it helps provide, you know, it's kind of the, the secret to the throughput and the small sample size that Uncle needs when running these experiments. Okay, so I mentioned that there is the ability of AAVs to unfold and the ability of kind of DNA to 
be exposed to cyber gold fluorescence and, and kind of uh, be detected that way. So the first question to address is, how do we know that AAV capsid stability has these two different modes, one where uh, capsid disruption is driven by protein unfolding, and another one where there's genome injection where there can be DNA escaping capsids. Uh, so this is actually seen in the literature uh, in the paper by Bruneau, where the authors use atomic force microscopy on serotypes uh, AAV8 and AAV9 uh, to look at how capsid morphology changed over increasing temperatures. So at room temperature, they very typically have intact uh, round spherical capsids, which on AFM would look like a sort of bright white disc. As temperature increased, they began to see two different failure modes, one where DNA was linearly ejected from relatively intact capsids. So you can see, again, the bright white disc with the linearly ejected DNA coming out of it. And the second failure mode is the compact DNA being left behind in a complex tangled pile uh, of DNA after protein shells have ruptured and burst. So with this physical evidence in support of that model of two different uh, stability breakdown paths for AAV, we can start to take a look at what we can see with this on the uncle. So first we will investigate uh, AAV capsid disruption by looking at the intrinsic fluorescence of the capsid protein. The idea here is we're gonna heat up the AAV sample and monitor how those capsid proteins are unfolding using the uncle's UV laser and full spectrum fluorescence. What the raw data for that process looks like is this. Here we have the uh, 266 nanometer UV laser. It's coming into the sample and then any light that's bounced back out is the static light scattering signal. But that light is also exciting fluorescence of the AAV capsid proteins. So those capsid proteins uh, reflect a fluorescence with the starting line here at the top. And then as the sample is heated up, uh, fluorescence is continually gathered from the samples. And you can see that that fluorescence decreases and shifts to the right as temperature increases. Uh, that, red sh that shift to the right is called a redshift. And we'll be tracking that behavior by looking for kind of the spectral center of mass. So it's the, it's the wavelength where half the area under the curve is to the left, half the area of the curve is to the right. And so as that spectra shifts to the right, then we know that that center of mass wavelength, which we call the BCM wavelength, also shifts to the right towards the higher wavelengths. Uh, what that experiment looks like is this. So in blue, we're tracking the intrinsic fluorescence of AAV capsids. You'll notice that BCM wavelength starts at a certain level. And then as capsids start to unfold, that's our T onset, and our TM is identified as the inflection point in that unfolding behavior. Aggregation uh, starts at about 78 or 74 degrees Celsius. And this is reflected by the S plus signal, where it starts to increase as capsids begin to aggregate. OK, so that's aggregation unfolding seen at the same time with one experiment uh, showing you capsid disruption behavior, which for AV9, we saw start at about 74 degrees Celsius uh, and then increase uh, for a few degrees after that. Now, to examine the second stability pathway, uh, the genome ejection pathway, we're going to add cyber gold dye because cyber gold dye has a very uh, useful behavior, which is it has a relatively low initial fluorescence and then increases when in the presence of a nucleic acid. So as that DNA escapes in the AV capsid, that cyber gold fluorescence will increase and we'll just measure the area under the curve for that fluorescence behavior. The raw data again looks like this. So in this case, we're using the blue 473 nanometer laser, again, gathering SLS data from that. And we are uh, getting cyber gold fluorescence behavior here between about 500 and 650 nanometers. And you can see again, the many lines of a, the fluorescence data gathered by alcohol as temperature increases. And in this case, the data increases and we're just gonna measure that area into the curve. Results of this experiment, uh, but what they're analyzed look like this. So in green, we're tracking the fluorescence uh, data, which is the area under the curve of cyber gold. We see that it starts at a certain level, which is gonna to correspond to how much free DNA is floating around in a sample that's either unpurified or had been aged a little bit and capsids have been degrading over time. And as we increase temperature in this experiment, cyber gold fluorescence first decreases because there's a relationship between cyber gold uh, fluorescence and temperature, easily shown through a control. Uh, but the headline of, of this experiment is about at about 50 degrees Celsius, when the temperature or the cyber gold fluorescence begins to increase as the DNA begins to be released from the capsids. 
that behavior continues through an inflection point of about 58 degrees Celsius, all the way up until about 75 degrees Celsius, when we see again, aggregation begin to occur because of the SLS data that we're gathering using our blue laser. This data was gathered using uh, 1 13 VG per millibay AB9, uh, but it's the kind of thing where you can gather data all the way down from five times 10 to 11 VG per mil uh, across a wide range of serotypes. What's also pretty valuable about this experiment is that it's also a stability measurement and an aggregation measurement in one. And that aggregation measurement is a convenient way to link between our cyber gold ejection experiments and our intrinsic fluorescence experiments looking at cap. Okay, so I mentioned that that experiment was with AAV9, and on the left we can see uh, the results of an experiment where we could vary the percent full of a uh, AAV9 sample, uh, and this results look kind of like you would expect. Decreasing percentage of percent full results in decreasing intensity of fluorescence because there's less DNA present. Very similar uh, trend appears if you look at different concentrations of AAV. So if we compare AAV9 versus another serotype, AAV5 shown on the right, we can also see that different serotypes had different shapes and different behaviors, uh, especially focusing on the, the temperature range between about 40 and 50 degrees Celsius. You can notice that AAV5 has a much more pronounced uh, DNA release coming out of those capsids than that of AAV9. Okay, so with all of that kind of background knowledge in our back pocket, uh, what my team did is we went onto the literature and saw uh, this really excellent paper from Duong Quang Gao's lab uh, at University of Massachusetts, <clears throat> uh, published in Nature Communications. So we saw this beautiful figure looking at uh, the relationship between pH uh, and temperature for two different capsid types. And we thought to ourselves, wow, that's a really excellent demonstration of temperature and kind of buffer. So we took it as, as a, a squad goal, a team goal, to see what we could do in, in terms of replicating that sort of same sort of experiment and exploring other buffers and, and serotypes. And before we did that, we also took another pit stop in the literature at this paper by Bennett to kind of see what, was, what else was out there for other serotypes uh, in different buffers. And what this paper by Bennett has shown is that there is a wide range in uh, protein unfolding temperatures. So here we're looking at when capsids unfold uh, as done by a dye-based assay, but still when capsids unfold. And you notice that there's a wide range going across serotypes, and there's also differences in the distribution range for a serotype. So AAV2 and 3 have very large uh, differences in unfolding temperatures, depending on the buffer that they're in, where other serotypes like AAVs 8 and 9 have a very narrow range of protein unfolding temperatures. This is useful and kind of helped set our understanding uh, that choice of buffer does impact serotype unfolding, and it has a different uh, magnitude of effect based on the serotype that you're looking at. So that brought us to our BFFs or our buffer friends forever, uh, Big Tuna and Uncle. In this experiment, what we did was we buffer exchanged AAVs 2, 8, and 9 into uh, acetate or citrate phos phosphate buffer across a range of buffers, a range of pHs, excuse me, and also use that to compare it against pH at the starting, uh, or pH 7.4 in the starting buffer of PBS. This is all done using an unfiltered 96 plate with a molecular weight cutoff filter of 10 kilohms. Once we did those buffer exchange experiments, then we were able to run them on uncle and again screen for capsid stability and genome injection behavior. Now, just as a quick background on what Big Tuna uh, does with the sample to buffer exchange, it, it starts out with a uh, measurement of the volume of the sample in its uh, unfiltered consumable plate. Uh, this is done in a, a non contact ultrasound method. Then it uses positive pressure to force uh, buffer through that, in this case, 10. Uh, kilovolt molecular weight cutoff filter at the bottom of the plate, measures uh, the volume again, adds the buffer that you want to end up in, and then iterates that process until it's exchanged a certain preset uh, percentage of the buffer. So this is how we can get from our starting buffer of pH 7.4 into a wide, wide range of pHs across two different buffers and three different serotypes quite easily and quite quickly in, in a very hands-off manner. Okay, so let's take a look at the results from that experiment, starting with capsid disruption. In this case, we'll focus in just on the AV2 and 9 serotypes uh, across a few different pHs and compare it to that PBS control. 
what we'll see is pretty quickly uh, that the AAV2 experiment indeed does have a wider range of uh, melting temperatures for that capsid behavior, uh, especially when you compare it to the AAV9 behavior where all the melting temperatures, uh, all those inflection points are clustered rather closely. So this is pretty neat raw data as a readout, but let's graph this a little bit differently just to help us understand the trends here. Okay, so if we bring in our AAV8 data as well, we can graph that buffer pH versus the uncle melting temperature for capsid disruption. And we'll see a couple patterns. First is a trend uh, where that unfolding temperature increases as we go to more acidic pHs for AAV2. And I'll have more comments on pH4 later. Uh, and then we also see that AAV8 is actually relatively flat with one kind of bump that is a very strong behavior. It's not an outlier. It's definitely a true uh, response to the pH6. And then AAV9 has an even tighter distribution on its melting temperatures and its capsid unfolding. So if we compare those uncle-derived capsid unfolding melting temperatures against uh, what the Bennett paper showed us earlier, we get results that look like this, where these uncle stability temperatures uh, agree very, very closely with the range of unfolding temperatures observed by Bennett when they're comparing serotypes against their ranges of different buffers as well which really helps to point out that the range of uncle melting temperatures does agree with the literature uh, and that it supports uh, the result that, that Bennett saw previously, uh, where each of these serotypes has its own kind of behavior in a different range of serotypes. And it can be affected both by buffer salts as shown by Bennett or just by pH as shown by these results here. Okay, so let's pivot and check out that genome ejection result as well. And here we'll focus in on just the AAB2 sample and the pHs of that acetate buffer, which is, if you noticed earlier, the ones where we had pHs 7, 6, and 5, but 4 was missing. So what happened? Well, if we check out pHs 7, 6, and 5, you can see that sort of trend of decreasing, uh, of, of changing pH, changing the melting behavior of your capsid. If we can really easily just plot that result next to the capsid unfolding result, we'll see the intrinsic fluorescence driving the capsid stability behavior in blue which the melting temperature decreases at more neutral pHs. And the genome ejection uh, behavior from a cyberbell fluorescence experiment also shows a very similar pattern, a similar trend, where that behavior uh, decreases at the more neutral pHs. So this is kind of amazing because this is two simple experiments on an AAV2 sample in a buffer that was quickly exchanged on Big Tuna, uh, all delivering complete answers on what's happening with our capsid in these different pHs. Uh, very quickly and elegantly using only two nine microliter samples uh, at, each, at each pH tested. So pretty cool and pretty interesting to see that the trends are consistent across the different pHs. Now, what happened with that pH four sample? So in that case, what we actually start out with is a much higher initial uh, fluorescence coming from Cyberbull, and that stays consistent. We don't see the, the characteristic ejection trend that we're used to seeing with this Cyberbull experiment elsewhere. So what's occurring with this uh, capsid is that AAV2 has actually lost its capsid integrity in this uh, acetate buffer at pH 4. This is something that we're confirming a few different ways. Uh, first is through this high initial burst of cyberbull fluorescence, followed by uh, kind of no characteristic unfolding, melting, or aggregation temperature. And the second is by looking at the, uh, this capsid by DLS and confirming that we're not seeing any uh, intact capsid peak that we expect and, and indeed do see with other uh, capsids in their pHs. So pretty interesting experiment that shows us that not only did we have a increasing trend in stability as we get to lower pHs, but that trend is also U-shaped and it reverses as we get to uh, pH like pH 4 where capsid integrity was lost in this experiment for AAV2. And lastly, I do want to emphasize that all of this data could be gathered in just one day. Uh, with a few hours on Big Tuna, a few hours on Uncle, and then combine that with a second overnight on, on Uncle, and you can get everything done in about less than 24 hours, uh, which is pretty amazing considering it equals about one nature figure. So quite proud of that experiment. Okay, changing topics. So with some AAV problems, you bite into them and it's just not what you expect. What do I mean by that? So let me show you. In this case, we have everyday normal AAV. We are looking at the 
capsid unfolding and melting behavior. And we're looking at it by actually checking out the 350 to 330 nanometer ratio. So not the BCM in this case, but there's a very good reason for that. So here we're seeing a, a typical capsid unfolding temperature at 78 degrees Celsius, uh, and the, the behavior looks a lot like what we'd expect. But if we check out the second sample that was run uh, at the same time with this same serotype, it was very confusing because it had a dramatically different behavior. Uh, the ratio showed that it started having an unfolding behavior around 35 degrees Celsius, and the inflection point just didn't make any sense anymore compared to what we already knew about this serotype. So what was going on? Well, thankfully, with Uncle's full spectrum fluorescence, we can take a closer look. Here at 15 degrees Celsius at the starting point of our thermal ramp experiment, uh, things look normal. We have our intrinsic fluorescence uh, peak here. We have our SLS peak from 266. We do have this uh, kind of mystery peak over here, but it is a pretty minor signal. But let's hit play and see how this uh, temperature, how this fluorescence behavior changes as temperature goes up. What we'll notice is that sort of mystery peak at about 440, that really goes crazy and starts to increase fluorescence as temperature increases as well. So freezing things, you can see kind of the pattern where the protein peak on the left decreased and that mystery peak on the right increased dramatically as temperature goes up. We can focus in on just that maximum temperature on a melting experiment and see that indeed there's a lot of signal coming from that uh, peak on the right all the way down to 350 and 330 nanometer ratios, uh, which overlaps with that initial peak uh, of the, just the protein. So this is telling us actually time to kind of unveil the, the mystery sample here. So it's actually comparing a sample containing iodixanol to one that was not containing iodixanol. And here we're seeing this strong peak, that's from the iodixanol. And that fluorescence increases more as temperature increases and starts to interfere with that traditional ratio measurements uh, and in, indeed interfere with that protein fluorescence uh, and complicate the story for AAV capsid unfolding. Uh, just to show it one more time by contrast, Here's our 0% iodixanol sample, where we see just the protein signal uh, fluorescing like normal. And here's our sample containing only 0.02% iodixanol, a very low uh, volume percentage, but a massive amount of fluorescence intensity. Thankfully, Uncle's full spectrum fluorescence also offers a solution to this problem because iodixanol doesn't impact genome ejection and the cyber gold dye that we're using to measure genome ejection behavior. Uh, that's because we're using that blue laser to excite uh, cyber gold fluorescence, but iodexanol is not excited by that same uh, laser wavelength, so we can get a nice clean result without any uh, interference by iodexanol, and indeed identify melting temperatures at these two samples, even where we've cranked up the iodexanol concentration 5x higher than what I showed you previously, still that signal doesn't interfere with the genome ejection behavior as seen by using our cyber gold assay. So a pretty nice solution to a problem that if you're only looking at ratio, you wouldn't even be able to notice. And that's the idea of how to look at AAV stability using thermal uh, ramps on uncle. With capsid disruption and looking at intrinsic fluorescence, we can observe uh, capsid disruption behavior above about 70 degrees Celsius, again, depending a lot on the buffer and pH that you're in. And with cyber gold fluorescence, we can investigate those genome injection behaviors that occur anywhere from 40 to 70 degrees Celsius and really start to show the beginning of when your capsid starts to break down. And so now with all of this uncle data, you can help to create an AAV that's ready for battle, uh, not afraid of that broadsword wielding Viking, and then AAV is not going to fall apart when under stress. So with that, I think I'll stop and we'll take any questions we have. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was excellent. So thank you. So I'm going to attempt to summarize everything you just presented. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to just kind of make sure that I, I get this right, right? So the idea there was to look at capsid stability on Uncle um, for AVs. Uh, and so you start by essentially telling us that there are two ways to think of stability, right? So one of which is to focus on the actual nuclear capsid, which is protein-based. Um, and the other one is to focus, of course, on the payload or the genetic content, which is going to be generally single-stranded DNA, but in nucleic acid, uh, content there, right? And you made a very interesting analogy to a pinata, right? Um, others would make an analogy to a Trojan horse, right? But the idea is exactly that, right? So the horse gets you through the door, right? That's the big shiny thing that gets you in. And of course, the content of that 
is going to be what has the most impact uh, and hopefully be able to help correct some diseases and bring about therapeutics, right? And so as I understand, the onco essentially has the ability to look at intrinsic fluorescence, uh, dye-based fluorescence, and you also looked at some aggregation data as well. Um, and so as I kind of went through your presentation, I thought something was interesting, which is that you kind of reminded us that the serotype itself matters, right? And it would be very convenient for someone to say, I'm going to just use AV9 then, right? But certainly we know that certain serotypes are more optimal for certain tissue targets. Um, and so certainly one will have to look at all of them. And so the goal will be ultimately to formulate them and optimize them in a condition that makes them more stable. And so through your data here, you're able to show us that the serotype itself, right, can impact stability. And I saw a number of TMs purely based on the serotype. Uh, you also did a very nice um, and clever formation screen where you looked at different buffers across different pH um, values. And here you're able to again show that the serotype itself, right, the vector and the sorry, the capsid is impacted by the pH, by the buffer selection, um, and all of that will impact your stability. And then you went in and also showed that just as we had seen in the paper, right, the genomic ejection, which I think is really interesting of a concept, because as we talk to customers, that is one of the most perhaps um, underappreciated yet necessary part of the analysis, uh, which is going to be to essentially um, think about what happens to nucleic acid content after um, you know, long-term stability or thermal ramp and things of that sort, right? And so you're able to show that the dye measurement allows us to do so. And again, same idea, the, the serotype matters and certainly the buffer or the formulation of the condition matters as well for stability. Um, and then what I really liked about the end, <laughs> nod, right, to iodix and all, uh, but also to the analysis method, right? And so you're able to actually show that, you know, one of the unique things and the benefits, the amazing part of the, the Uncle platform is the full spectrum, right? And so had we only been limited to a fluorescence ratio, we may not have gotten the complete picture, but by being able to look at the raw data, the complete spectrum, we can actually see that it is in fact perhaps some leftover iodix and all, that is impacting the perceived um, data if we do a fluorescence ratio. And the uncle offer you the, flex the flexibility to be able to diagnose the issue and certainly use some of our other capabilities, dye-based measurements, um, to still characterize the genome injection um, and give you a complete picture of stability. Does that sound about right? That does sound about right. And I especially like the part where you were talking about um, tropism kind of driving the serotype selection a lot of the time. And this shows that tropo, or, you know, serotype selection does have an impact, impact on stability, but buffers and formulation give you another lever to pull if you want to put all of your, say, serotype selection points uh, on, on the reason, on tropism and tissue selection. Yeah. I, I did notice that you had an example with AV2 versus AV9, where the AV2 could be made to be much more stable if you change the pH or the actual buffer. So it's quite interesting to, to note that. So thank you. Excellent. So with the time that we have left, we're going to go over to the q and um, It looks like we have a lot of questions that have come in, and so we'll go through them as best as we can, and we'll see how far we get. So question number one, do different serotypes have different aggregation behavior? Uh, yes, they do. So that was something that we didn't focus a lot on. Uh, I mentioned SLS at the start, uh, but yes, they do. And that aggregation behavior uh, has a, a similar kind of range to the capsid unfolding behavior that you typically see. Okay. Um, the next question, which would be, what is the AV concentration required for the measurement in Uncle? Good one. So uh, the AV concentration for a cyber gold experiment is about five times 10 to the 11th VG per mil. Mm -hmm. And the AV concentration required for a cap stability experiment is about five times 10 to the 12th uh, CP per mil. Sounds good. Um, and so how would testing thermal stability help me with my process development? Mm. This is a good question. It's also one that we've put an application note out there um, because when you're dealing with different anion exchange uh, chromatography steps, uh, then you're dealing with temperature and a range of different buffers and a range of different salt strengths and pHs. Uh, so this will help you evaluate all of those buffers in your chromatography setup and understand what impact they can have on your AAV and kind of give you some guidance in trying to optimize yield for that phase too. Excellent. Next question came from Sembit Carr, and he's asking, does repeated filtration for buffer exchange cause any virus degradation? Can a single buffer exchange column prep any better? Uh, so I can, I can address the first half of the question, uh, which is the repeated filtration impact on AAV. This is something that we'll typically look at uh, on Big Tuna by taking a sample that's starting in PBS and buffer exchanging it just into PBS, uh, into the same buffer. So it has kind of a process control uh, to it where 
um, that doesn't really have an impact on the AAV itself. And again, it's something um, that we have an application note on that covers both Big Tuna and Uncle for uh, AAV buffer exchange. That's a good point. And I think it's also worth adding that, um, you know, as people think about automating some of the workflow that they have for you know, formulation, um, it is still very relevant to have an analytical tool to go along with that, right? And I think that's kind of what Uncle can do when you juxtapose it next to a big tuna or any other liquid handling or automated robotic system. So that's a great point. Uh, the next question that we have here says, can you use Uncle's DLS when looking at AV stability? Yes, absolutely. And it was something that I didn't show a lot of data on it today, uh, but it was something that I mentioned, um, for example, with that AAV2 sample at pH4 and the acetate buffer, that was one of the really uh, quick and easy red flags to signal to us that, hey, this buffer, this AAV has suffered from severe uh, structural insult, so to say, um, because the DLS is showing that the, the capsid uh, just isn't present. And conversely, uh, for all the serotype, for all the serotypes and buffers where things are normal, you just get very nice uh, DLS peaks for those samples. Thank you. Okay, so there's a question here that seems to be one that we just talked about. So maybe you're worth kind of refreshing the audience on that one. So why isn't aerodixinol fluorescence a problem when using cybergold dye? So in that case, uh, iodixinol fluoresces very, very strongly when excited by a UV laser. But if we simply use a blue laser, then all of a sudden we've kind of gotten to the other side of where iodixinol is, is you know, excited by. So by using that blue laser, we're no longer exciting the, the chemical makeup of, of that external um, structure. And so we, we avoid that problem entirely. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think just to create, add to this, right? So obviously aerodixinol is used during one of the purification steps. Um, and so it's also a good marker or indicator of how successful one has been at purifying their samples, right? Um, but certainly I think the ability to leverage the dye in the full spectrum of Uncle to still be able to look at genome ejection even though the sample hasn't been completely purified or cleaned, right? It's quite useful. Um, and so it's a good insight to be able to do that in, in parallel. Good. Um, there's a question that came again from Sembit Carr where he asked, have the ejection and capsid breakdown phenomena captured under microscope or light scattering? So I think you touched on this when you had the EM data. Um, and so could you maybe speak on that process itself? Yeah, so if you dive into the literature on this, um, the data that I showed in this presentation was AFM or atomic force microscopy data, but there's, uh, there's SEM data, there's TEM data. Um, so that's all kind of agreeing with this behavior. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, it is atomic force microscopy, sorry, not EM. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Um, so is this better for upstream or downstream samples? Like where do you think the uncle fits best? And do you have perhaps an indication of how well it would be suited maybe for customers upstream and users who are going to be using it downstream. Right, so because of the uncle sample requirements, it's going to need to run samples that have probably been through your whole process and purification process and concentration process, but it's gonna be useful for answering questions all up and down the process. So if you're doing lead ID or optimization, then understand the impact of different mutations on your capsid stability is a critical question that uncle can answer. Uh, that's kind of at the very start of your, you know, design of your capsid. Uh, likewise, we talked about process development for uh, morphography buffers and elution buffers, uh, or formulation at the end of your uh, AAV process. Uh, that's right in Uncle's wheelhouse in understanding how pH and buffers impact your stability. So really, Certainly. It, yeah, yeah it, used, it needs those concentrated samples, but it answers critical questions for the whole pipeline. Yeah, and as I remember, Uncle is 21 CFR Part 11 compliant, right? So as you move downstream, you can certainly have this system that is in fact regulated um, and can be can be placed in those environments, right? Yep, yeah, it's a simple software add-on. Excellent, good. Um, and so the last question here that we can answer within the time that we have says, does this work with self-complementary AV? Uh, yes, it does. Actually, if you dive into the literature, that's one of the very early experiments that was done is looking at uh, different you know, uh, single-stranded or self-complementary AAV and the impact that it has on the capsid. And, uh, you know, kind of leave that as a cliffhanger for people that want to go dive into the literature. I believe that paper is first author is Horowitz. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Kevin. So thank you as well to the audience um, for joining us today. We really appreciate you, not only you joining us, but also your questions. Uh, so we encourage you to follow up by either emailing us at info at or visiting our websites. Uh, and from there, you can find ways to reach any of us if you have any questions or follow up. Um, and so again, once again, we thank you and wish you a wonderful day and we'll see you soon. Thank you.